Welcome, my loves, to another episode. I was very inspired to record this episode because this episode was inspired by three listeners' questions that were all very similar. So the title of this episode, I'm sure you already know by now, is what to do when you are comparing your food to others. Now, I'm going to read the questions out specifically because I think it will help you to resonate and perhaps just resonate with what they're saying and maybe you're experiencing the same and so joe says something i am really struggling with is comparing what i eat i even do this with my husband i feel totally greedy for what i want and the amounts i get really moody and annoyed if he leaves anything and i slow my eating so that he finishes first so i can work out what i can have i even get stressed when he exercises i know he makes me i know this makes me sound dreadful She's not dreadful. But unless I am honest, I won't get these thoughts rewired. Please help. That was one question from Joe. Marie Kristen says, I always feel guilty when others leave food, when they don't eat or when I eat more than them. And my lovely client, Julia, says, I have to leave what my husband leaves. I can't finish my plate if he hasn't. Now, that's not true for her anymore because she's been working with me one to one. But then at the time when she asked this question, this was when I was starting to plan this episode. So I want to first go into when comparing can be helpful occasionally, mirroring someone's eating behavior. It can be helpful occasionally if otherwise you literally wouldn't eat anything at all unless others were eating. So when I was personally recovering from anorexia, I used to watch what others ate like a hawk. If they ate more than me, I would feel a sense of safety and achievement even. If they ate less than me, or if I heard that for some reason they hadn't eaten much all day, I would literally hate them. I would feel feelings of hatred towards these people through no fault of their own. My sister told me that she used to eat more than she actually needed to help me to feel safe to eat when I was in recovery from anorexia. So thank you, Michelle. That was really sweet and really helpful. And it did have it did help me because I had like a reference point to compare to or for someone to model what eating looked like because I could not trust myself I didn't even know how to eat. I didn't even want to eat. And so having someone that I could model, it was really helpful for that point in my recovery. When I was in the binge eating and bulimia, so I was weight restored. Well, I thought I was weight restored. I wasn't malnourished anymore. So I wasn't dangerously at a low weight and I wasn't malnourished anymore. But I used to copy my sister's eating behavior, funnily enough, when when we were on holiday and when we were just at home and I used to copy her behaviors so that I wouldn't eat in quotes too much. But interestingly enough, what I discovered by copying my sister's eating behaviors when I was in the binge eating and bulimia was that she actually ate what I thought was a lot of food. Now she was a normal eater. She would have breakfast, lunch, dinner, desserts and snacks whenever she wanted them. But she would also say no thank you to desserts or snacks sometimes. And that would trigger the hell out of me as I always wanted dessert. And then I wouldn't let myself have any unless she had it first or as well. So for me, that restriction turned into binge eating in secret and hating myself for it and comparing myself to my sister. In terms of exercise, I literally, if I literally just got back from a run and my boyfriend at the time was on his way out to the gym, I would be so angry at him. Literally what would be going through my mind would be how dare he go and exercise when I'm not exercising as well. Like nobody else is allowed to exercise and if I've exercised more even though I'd literally just come back from a very long run. I would also be a feeder. I would want others to gain weight. I would want others to not exercise. It sounds crazy and manipulative and kind of evil, but I know that so many of you will be able to relate to this. And after reflection and research, and obviously the job that I do, I'm in this all day, every day, always learning and always bettering myself with knowledge and wisdom. 
I've come to the conclusion that in the migration response, and if you're not entirely sure what the migration response is, it might become more clear as I'm explaining now, but definitely check out the, the episode, which was actually last week. So if you're listening to this one now, it just go back one week with Tabitha Farrar. It wasn't her theory. I can't remember the lady who, who came up with this theory. It's not even a theory. It's it's backed by research. It's so freaking interesting. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit here. So anyway, I digress. On reflection and research, I've come to the conclusion that the migration response when the anorexia gene is switched on, anyone who is eating more, anyone who is eating, sorry, anyone who is moving more than you, anyone who is eating less than you would have been a threat to your survival. Think about this. If your biology thinks you are migrating because to a land of abundant food because your current environment is in a famine, anyone else that got there quicker than you would be a threat to your survival. They would get there first, they would eat the food first, and therefore they would definitely survive. You might not survive if they got there first by moving more and eating less, right? And so when you're in this response, this fear response, you're not you anymore. You're evil, you're grumpy, you're angry, you're hateful to those that are trying to support you. And you lie. I used to lie all the time about food throughout my whole eating disorder journey from the anorexia to the binge eating. And this is because you're in survival mode and all your all your animal brain cares about is survival. So the only way to get out of that migration response as soon as possible is to eat lots of food and to rest a lot. Now, this is the hardest thing in the world to do because you're literally going against your biology at this point. Because when your anorexia gene is activated, your biology is screaming at you to eat less and move more. And going against that honestly feels impossible, but it is not impossible. It really isn't. You can override your biology at this point because as well, ultimately, you're actually starving and malnourished. So you've kind of got two things going on here. You've got the migration response, which has been switched on by the anorexia gene, meaning the environment that you're in is in a famine. You need to move as fast as you can, as quick as you can, keep moving, keep moving, don't eat much at all because any kind of stopping and eating a lot is going to stop you from getting to that land of abundant food and otherwise you're going to starve to death, hence the moving compulsion that generally comes with anorexia. That is your biology, that's your biological response to survival. And so to feel like you need to override that biological response, like I said, it feels impossible. But at the same time, because this isn't a real migration response that we would have gone through back in the day, hundreds of years ago, or however long it would have been, probably more than that, caveman times, because we've evolved from that. And we still have the, this gene going around, because it actually, the ones that have the genetic predisposition disposition for anorexia come from a line of survivors because they would have got to a land of abundant food and not therefore died of starvation but the thing is because this isn't a normal like environmental response to migration because it's all in your head and your biology is reacting to that and you live with an abundant amount of food it's not a normal amount of time to spend in the migration response at best you would have spent if this was an actual generally a migration response like however many thousands or hundreds of years ago you would be in the migration response for weeks or only months at a time that is it many with eating disorder spend years in this in this response and of course then comes underneath that and that can be used to help you get out of the anorexia is the absolute starvation underneath it all the desperate need to eat more food and so you do not have to be underweight by the way in terms of the bmi to be classed as anorexic like i don't want to just throw labels around and i guess i am spe specifying here but you are sick enough you don't have to be like at death's door to get help. You don't have to have the anorexia gene to be suffering, which I'm going to go into in a minute. But in overall, you can 
override your biology response to the migration response because you're actually starving and malnourished. And so you can do it. You can be underweight at any body weight as it depends on what your natural weight is. So when I was in my anorexia, I won't really go into numbers of how much I weighed, but even on the BMI scale, yes, I was under BMI, but not drastically, but I was literally slowly dying because my body weighs heavier naturally from bones, whatever, compared to what people always thought I looked like and compared to the BMI scale. I, t I say this to you time and time again, because I think it's really important that my BMI, I'm over my BMI, like I'm way into the overweight category, but I'm, I'm a healthy, natural weight for me. And so that's why I'm sharing this because you can be underweight at any scale on the BMI. It, you don't have to be looking like a skeleton to be malnourished. I just want to get, you know, to share that. It's really important. So as I was saying, the migration, whether you're in a migration response or not, whether you have the anorexia gene or not, it doesn't really matter because either way, if you've had anorexia before or if you've never experienced it before, you are now, if you're reading this, if you're listening to this, if you're watching this, the reason I said reading is because I've just wrote a blog and I saw that word and then it went into my mind. So you can read this as well if you don't want to listen to me talk about it. But if you're listening to this right now, unfortunately, you would have actually been having your fear of weight gain conditioned in your mind, in your body, in your trauma response since birth. So currently you will have, have you will have severely cemented neuropathways that are currently always acting in fear of weight gain. And unfortunately, as I said, this fear of weight gain comes from the moment you were born and your conditioning and upbringing will have determined the severity of your fear of weight gain. So it doesn't matter if you're in the, anorex in the anorexia, whether you've had anorexia, whether you've never had anorexia, even if your weight restored enough not to be malnourished, and that's what happened to me. I was in the anorexia, the migration response was on. I, I was force fed and I like, well, force fed myself as well and went into the recovery stage my anorexia biology gene was switched off because I was, well, I mean, this is so complicated, right? And I'm not like, so I've not been doing this research for years. This is new research to me in terms of the anorexia gene, but my, I wasn't malnourished anymore. My body was a, a classed healthy weight, which for me was still underweight. So probably I was still in it with that migration response. Either way, when I was binge eating and then trying to compensate for that with purging in the bulimia, I was still underweight. So again, I most likely was in the anorexia response with the migration response with the gene turned on. But it doesn't matter whether you think you're in a large body, medium body, small body, skinny body. It doesn't matter if you have a severe fear reaction to any potential weight gain, then you're in the right place. Because migration response or not, these feelings can almost be just as strong as a bio biological response to the migration response. Are you with me? So migration response or not, whether you've had anorexia or not, whether you've seen in the anorexia or whatever, the feelings of fear of weight gain can be just as strong as the biological feelings to the migration response telling you to move more and eat less. I've experienced both in the migration response, out of the migration response. And they can honestly feel truly deliberating. This is why even if you haven't had anorexia, you can still experience all of the symptoms, such as an attempt to compensate for a binge, constantly comparing your food, trying to purge the behaviors from binge eating or emotional eating, excessive compulsive exercise behaviors, et cetera. And if you're physically and or emotionally restricting currently, your brain thinks you're starving anyway, because you're constantly showing your brain that you're in a famine and your biology is going to fight back. So you will binge eat, which is a good thing. Binge eating is a natural, healthy response to restriction, but it's your brain that needs to be rewired to not be fearful of weight gain if you're ever going to get out of this hellhole of the eating disorder or disordered eating and truly live in food freedom and body love. 
And it can absolutely be done. I'm living proof of that. All of my clients are, so many other incredible people out there are living proof that you can and will overcome this eating disorder, disordered eating, no matter what eating disorder you're experiencing. It's so possible, really. And so, as I said, occasionally copying someone's eating can be helpful. Just to recap, I ate more during my anorexia recovery because my sister was always eating more around me and encouraging me to eat. When I was in the bulimia, I actually saw from copying my sister what normal eating looked like. Look, what normal eating looked like and was honestly surprised at how much my sister ate during a typical day. Because it turns out, as grown-ass women or men, I know I have a few men listening to this, as grown-ass people, we need way more food than we think we do. The 2,000 calorie guideline um, guideline for a typical woman in the UK, that's what I know, I don't know if it's the same in the, any, anywhere else in the world because I don't actually care, is way off. Everyone is so different. Our bodies know what's up. If I were to guess now, and it is a guess because I don't count calories, I don't even do it in my head anymore. That went long ago because you can rewire that as well, not to do it automatically. And I can show you how to do that. I would say on average, I would eat over 3000 calories a day, about 3200 calories roughly a day. And that's just a complete guess, probably more if you were to average it out during the week. Interestingly enough, when I go on a run in the morning, I'm hungrier in the day. So therefore I eat more. If I have a rest day like yesterday, I notice just from reflection, I ate less that day because my body doesn't need it. Your body knows what's up. So During recovery from anorexia, I was eating about five to 6,000 calories a day for months, for months. And during my binge eating episodes, I would eat 8,000 calories in a night, in one sitting. So just putting it out there, like you can't, calories in, calories out, no. Because this is another episode I'm kind of getting into now. But the reason, the easiest way to stop counting calories, there's some tips or tricks that I can show you to stop the behavior. And I think I've done an episode about that anyway, called How to Stop Counting Calories, believe it or not. I'm pretty sure it's titled that. You need to get to the root cause. Imagine if there was zero point in counting calories, which there isn't, if you want to live in food freedom and body love, because we have weight set point theory, your hypothalamus in your brain actually does all that for you is pointless. So then therefore it's easier to stop counting something when it doesn't mean anything. And also if you stop before you get to a total, you you don't get that dopamine hit of counting the numbers and equaling them. So if you if you're counting and then you can be like stop, distract yourself, you don't get the dopamine hit of getting the total at the end. But anyway, go and check that episode out if it if it sounds like it might be helpful for you. But monitoring other people's plates and eating habits It's not only exhausting, but it's also perpetuating the eating disorder behaviors. Ultimately, the goal as soon as possible is to start to trust your own desires, start to trust your own appetite and start to trust your own hunger, physical and mental hunger. If you're currently experiencing binge eating and you, if, let me start again. If you're currently not experiencing binge eating, so perhaps you're in the restrictive eating disorder, although I believe binge eating is also a restrictive eating disorder, but if you're not currently experiencing binge eating and you don't actually have any hunger cues, any desire to eat, then it's still super important that you eat anyway and get support, get a recovery coach. I've, I'm supporting quite a few women through anorexia, active anorexia recovery right now. And I don't care if you don't want to eat. That's not the point because you're currently in the migration response. Your biology is telling you not to eat. You need to override this. And so an example of what my clients tend to, what I ask my clients to follow in terms of just a general guideline. So I don't do meal plans unless absolutely necessary because there's a lot of complications and negative effects from having a meal plan. I I get sent all the photos of what they eat so I can see what they're eating every day. A good guideline for anorexia recovery or any, any person that is alive and needs to eat to offer themselves this, this kind of routine 
And I say offer themselves, offer yourself this if you're a normal eater or you're experiencing binge eating, or it's not an offer, it's it's just an absolute rule, if you like, when you're in anorexia recovery, to eat breakfast, a snack, lunch and dessert, a snack, dinner and dessert, and a snack, which sounds like a lot of food. Like I said, I was eating about, what was it? Where did I write? I was eating about five five to 6,000 calories a day in my anorexia recovery. So you need to eat a lot of food to get out the migration response and to get weight restored. If you do have desires and hunger and appetite, I want you to follow these without exceptions. This means if everyone you're eating with only eats half of their meal, you eat all of yours and you have seconds if you want it. This means if you're thinking about chocolate and you've only just eaten, go and eat some chocolate regardless of whether someone is eating it or not. Follow your physical and mental hunger cues always. It's the only way to be truly free around food. And then what happens is over time, your body feels safe that there's enough food. Your cravings and desires for food all the time will naturally diminish as your body settles into the safety of enough food and into your natural set point weight. This is the case for any eating disorder or disordered eating, including binge eating. Binge eating, as I touched on earlier, is a restrictive eating disorder. I have not met anyone who binge eats without either previous or present physical or emotional restriction due to their fear of weight gain. And here's a recap of what emotional restriction is. Emotional restriction looks like physically allowing food, so you're eating what you want, but you're shaming yourself for doing so. You think you should be eating less. You feel guilty for eating certain foods or amounts of foods. You have fear of weight gain and keep thinking about how you can cut back or finding ways to control or to try to control what you're eating, whether you're successful at that or not. That's still emotional restriction. All the time you're physically allowing, yet you're still binge eating and you're wondering why. Emotional eating is very sneaky. So when you're comparing to what you're eating to other people, it can be really helpful to ask yourself these three questions. Number one, is this person in active recovery from an eating disorder such as anorexia, binge eating or bulimia? Number two, Has this person been through what I've been through with regards to my relationship with food? Number three, do I share this body with this person? If the answer is no to any of those questions, then there is absolutely no point whatsoever in comparing your food with theirs. And I know for many of you, and I've experienced this myself as well, it makes sense logically but it can almost feel compulsive and like you just have to compare anyway. And this is because my love fear is in the driving seat. Fear of weight gain is telling you all these lies because fear is a liar. These lies, like if you eat more than her or him, then you're greedy. You need to finish eating last because you're not allowed more food if you finish first anyway. Why can't you just leave food when you've had enough like they can? You're such a failure. You need to control yourself more. If they're not eating, it means you can't. If you can't let anyone watch you eat because everyone will stare at you and they'll see how disgusting you are. Nobody can see me eat. You need to eat in secret so nobody can see how much you're eating and how terrible and greedy you are. If they're fatter than you, you'll feel safer. Encourage them to eat more. Be a feeder. You must purge what you've eaten to feel clean and empty, etc. I mean, what has what does your fear response say to you to try to get you to stay in the eating disorder? Fear has absolutely no trust because all it wants to do is control everything. But here's the thing. Fear cannot hurt you unless you allow it to by following its demands and taking the action that it's demanding you to do. 
So I want you to do a little exercise and I'm going to give you a, a head start, but I seriously want you to pause this. I mean, who even does that? But I'm still asking anyway, or at least think about it. But bonus points for pausing it and writing this down and sharing it with me on social media. Tag me so I can share you with my audience and help others as well. I want you to write down 10 things that your body does for you that you can surrender to and trust that it knows what it's doing. I'll give you five to get you started. Number one, my body tells me when I need to pee. My body tells me when I need to poo. My body tells me when I'm cold and I need to get a jumper on. My body tells me when it's too hot and I need to do anything I can to cool down. My body tells me when I'm tired and I need to rest. Now you finish with five more things that your body does that you don't even have to think about and you just surrender and trust that. You can trust your body. We're just taught that we cannot trust our body with what to eat because of society's fear of weight gain, fat phobia and weight bias. If you do not rewire your fear of weight gain, you'll never fully recover. I have rewired my fear of weight gain, which I never thought would be possible for me in a million trillion years times affinity. And I must say as well, the fear of weight gain, overcoming that doesn't mean you gain weight. It might mean you gain weight. Most of you listening will have to gain weight in order to be in food freedom. Many of you won't. It doesn't matter because your body has that covered, right? And so what actions, another question for you that I really want you to take time to think about and write down what actions would you start taking if you trusted your body to let you know what when and how much to eat start taking these actions now feel the fear and do it anyway it's the only way out and for those that are in the anorexia or aren't experiencing hunger cues or anything like that what actions would you start taking if you knew you could overcome the eating disorder, because you can, for example, eating regularly, eating a lot and resting, start taking those actions now. Your life is happening now, not when you've lost X amount of pounds, not when you've got skinny enough, not when you're perfect enough. When is it ever going to be enough? What will it take for it to be enough? For you to truly then start living because I, I, I don't even invite you. I'm encouraging you. I'm pulling you lovingly to stop putting your life on hold because all because you've been brought up in a society that has taught you to fear weight gain and to hate your body. You can rewire that fear. You can love your body and you can live the life of your dreams in your natural, authentic body size reach out to me for support and we will get you there. The infinite amount of love I have for my clients and belief in every single one of them literally guarantees food freedom for them. Because I'm so, I, I give everything and I, I believe with all of my heart that they can and so then they do. And I'm going to leave you with this episode with some tips and tricks that will help you stop comparing your food to others as you start working on overcoming your root fear of weight gain. Because if you do not go to the root of the problem, then any progress will only ever be temporary. So some cheap tricks, if you like, some tips and tricks to help you stop comparing food are following. Eat alone so you cannot compare. I mean, it's not a great long-term solution as obvious for obvious reasons, Remind yourself that you're not that person that you're comparing yourself and your food to, and they're not you. Everyone has different requirements, different pasts, and different physical and emotional needs. Share your fears with the person you're eating with. Sometimes just sharing our shame can help. They can lovingly give you words of support. Create three mantras or more for yourself to remind yourself when you're doing the comparison, for example, I've given you a couple here. It's safe to eat what I want. I want what I need. That was a bloody big one for me. I want what I need. That is so true in terms of biology, which is eating. I choose freedom. 
They're not me. My body knows what to do for me. I can't control my food and feel happy and free. Let go. My food will be whatever it's going to be. Eating is not optional. Feel the fear and do it anyway. And last one, you can simply use your bloody mindedness and willpower to stop yourself from taking the action that fear is demanding that you take. You get to decide. If you literally had a gun to your head, (laughs) literally, I mean, it's not a nice thing to imagine, but imagine someone is literally holding a gun to your head and demanding that you do not take the action of your fear, whatever your fear is commanding you to do, eat less, move more, don't eat that because he's not eating that or whatever. If someone had a gun to your head telling you not to do the action that the fear in your head was commanding you to do, would you be able to not do the fearful action? I thought so. You do have the ability to stop. You have got this. You do have the ability. It's a choice. Sometimes it may feel like it's not a choice. You can. A prime example, my incredible client, Julie, yesterday was really struggling yesterday. She'd had some incredible days, like ticking off all the boxes, eating all the food, all of that. And then yesterday was like a really challenging day. And she messaged me saying, I can't eat breakfast. And I, this was on WhatsApp and I was like, you can eat breakfast. She's like, no, 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 I really can't. So I asked her a few more personal questions and I asked her the question I've shared with you. If someone had a gun to your head and said, eat that, would you be able to eat it? She swore at me and then kind of said, yes, she would be able to eat it. There you go. She gets to choose. I think I then asked her to give me 10 reasons why eating isn't optional and why she needs to eat. And then she got through the day. She ticked all the boxes off. And this morning she messaged me because also I get my clients to send me two things every morning. Those that are in anorexia recovery. One reason why they want to recover from the ED. And then another reason, another thing that they love about themselves. And she sent me that this morning and she said, thank you so much for getting, getting me through yesterday. I'm stronger than I realized. So you can do it. I know you can. So reach out to me if you need support on a one-to-one basis. I work with clients in anorexia recovery, bulimia recovery, binge eating recovery, those who are just in chronic yo-yo diet, binge cycling, those that don't love their bodies. Just reach out to me and we can have a chat to see if it's aligned for you. I also have my group coaching, the Body Love Buffet, if a group environment is more aligned for you. But either way, reach out to me. I'm here for you. If you have any questions for a podcast, because I absolutely love to get questions so I can record an episode off the back of the question. I know someone has asked me a question that I'm going to be recording not next week, the week after, because I have a, a podcast to release with a guest next week. I would love to hear from you for your questions so I can answer them in a podcast. So thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I love you so much. And I will see you on the next one. Much love.